Hello everybody, I am Dr. Armen, Professor Armen Astvatsatrian from Yerevan, Armenia, and we continue to talk about angina, angina pectoris. This is the sec second part of, of our lectures concerning angina pectoris. So, diagnosis of angina, typical symptoms. We mentioned about it in first lecture. ECG, stress testing with ECG or imaging using echocardiography, the most common of course, radionuclear imaging or MRI, coronary angiography for significant symptoms or positive stress test. Diagnosis of angina is suspected if chest discomfort is typical and is precipitated by exertion and relieved by rest. So, this is typical pain, huh? very suspected, even we can say about 100%. If uh, chest discomfort or pain is typical and precipitated by exertion and relieved by rest. Presence in the history of significant risk factor factors for coronary artery disease adds weight to resp uh, adds weight to reported symptom symptoms for coronary artery disease so adds weight to reported symptoms patients whose chest discomfort lasts more than 20 minutes or occurs during rest or who've got uh, syncope or heart failure are evaluated for an acute coronary syndrome about acute coronary syndrome we talk enough well, so chest discomfort, chest discomfort. Uh, actually, we can talk about chest pain. So pain or discomfort may also be caused by gastrointestinal disorders. For example, gastroesophageal reflux, gastroesophageal reflux. So reflux, esophageal spasm, very common. Indigestion, cholelithiasis, uh, costochondritis. Osteochondritis, costochondritis, anxiety, pain attacks, pain attacks very often, chest discomfort very, very often. So actually we can say that chest uh, panic attacks and chest discomfort so uh, common. So one of the typical uh, symptoms in uh, panic attacks. Hyperventilation and other cardiac disorders, for example, aortic dissection, pericarditis, mitral valve prolapse, supraventricular uh, tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, even when coronary blood flow is not compromised. We can see this chest discomfort. So this is an art of medicine to understand. Is it really uh, coronary artery disease? Is this is a real angina pectoris or not? Uh, very common also, very often, that no one of these gadgets, <laughs> uh, coronary angiography, uh, I don't know, echocardiography, MRI can help you. Well, you have to use your brain and understand is it is really chest discomfort or not due to coronary artery disease. So is this really angina or not? About chest pain, we talk about uh, about chest pain. Yet we talked in one of the lectures concerning chest pain. So I give you a link. And we, uh, we go on. So ECG is always done. More specific tests include stress testing. It's very the best. My, my opinion, if stress testing you use with, uh, with your brain is the, the best uh, evaluating testing concerning coronary artery disease existence. So ECG is always done. More specific tests include stress testing with ECG or with myocardial imaging. For example, echocardiography, radionuclide imaging, MRI, and coronary angiography. Non-invasive tests are considered first. So ECG, our famous ECG. Is if typical exertion symptoms are present, ECG is indicated. So actually, you can say ECG is indicated in all cases. Because engine resolves very, very quickly with rest, ECG rarely can be done during an attack, except during stress testing. Stress testing, once again, stress testing is the best of the best. Huh? 
Okay, so uh, if done during an angina attack, just during an attack, ECG is likely to show reversible ischemic changes. What are what of them? T wave discordant to the QRS vector. ST segment depression typically. ST segment elevation, but actually, if you see ST segment elevation during angina attack, this is not angina. This is. Uh, 99% this is uh, acute myocardial infarction ST segment elevation decreased air wave height decreased air wave height small air intraventricular umbilical branch conduction disturbances acute disturbances of course huh? uh, arrhythmia usually ventricular extrasystoles new onset of extrasystoles during uh, heart discomfort between angina attacks, DCG and usually left ventricle function at rest is normal in about 30% of patients with a typical history of angina pectoris, even those with extensive three vessel disease, in their, uh, uh, even those with extensive three vessel disease. Okay, so between angina attacks, ECG at rest is normal, also as left ventricle function during visual testing. Huh? In about 30% um, of patients with a typical history of angina pectoris, even those with extensive history of vessel disease. In the remaining 70%, the ECG shows evidence of previous infarction, uh, questionable, hypertrophy, so overload, or non-specific ST segment and T wave abnormalities, so reparalization abnormalities. An abnormal resting ECG alone doesn't establish or refuse the diagnosis. Uh, okay, about stress testing, about stress testing, once again, maybe, huh? okay, okay, I will talk about this. So, so stress testing is needed uh, to confirm the diagnosis, evaluate diseases, evaluate diseases severity, determine appropriate exercise levels for the patient, and help predict prognosis. If the clinical or working diagnosis is unstable angina, early stress testing is contraindicated. But it, dep it depends on uh, the quality of uh, professor, of uh, specialist who works on this stress test. So I will give you a link concerning stress testing. Huh? Uh, exercise stress testing with ECG is done if a patient has a normal resting ECG and can exercise, of course. In men with chest discomfort, suggesting angina, stress ECG testing has a specificity 70%, sensitivity is 19%. But all depends on a specialist. All. Sensitivity is similar in women, but specificity is lower particularly in women uh, less than 55 years old, so less than 70%. Why? Because women think one thing, say about another thing, and feel about third thing. Uh, That's all with ladies' history. However, women are more likely than men to have an abnormal resting ECG when coronary artery disease is present. Although sensitivity is reasonably high, exercise ECG can miss severe coronary artery disease, even left main or three vessel disease. But once again, it depends on specialists huh, who make this stress test. In patients with atypical symptoms, a negative stress ECG usually rules out angina pectoris and coronary artery disease. A positive result may or may not represent coronary ischemia and indicates need for further, further testing. Uh, stress testing with myocardial imaging is done when the resting ECG is abnormal because the false positive ST segment shifts are common on the stress ECG. Exercise on pharmacological stress, for example, dobutamine or dipiridamol may be used. Actually, once again, I want to talk about flecainid stress test, my mind stress test, if you remember. Uh, I talk about this, so <coughs> my proposal to give flecainid and uh, look at the QRS complex. If you see QRS complex enlargement during stress test or during rest. So, very typical. 
and of future coronary artery disease or present coronary artery disease and future my future of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, so future death. So flecainid, <coughs> your patient on flecainid, do this flecainid stress test or do just stress test and remark with flecainid uh, the QRS complex changes, the wideness of QRS complex. So beginning of the branch blocks. Huh? So it's the sign of uh, coronary artery disease and future ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Okay, <coughs> that's concerning uh, pharmacological stress. So imaging options include stress echocardiography, myocardial perfusion we imaging with single photon emission spect or PET and stress MRI. The choice of imaging, imaging technique depends on institutional availability and expertise. Imaging tests can uh, help assess left ventricle function and response to stress, identify areas of ischemia, infraction, and viable tissue, and determine the site and extent of myocardium at risk. Stress echocardiography can also detect ischemia-induced mitral regurgitation. Now about angiography. Coronary angiography is the standard for diagnosing coronary artery disease, but it's not always necessary to confirm the diagnosis. It's indicated primarily to locate and assess severity of coronary artery lesions when revascularization PCI, or coronary artery bypass grafting cabbage, is being considered. Hey, we have, we have to understand this. You have to understand this. This is actually not for patient, it's for <laughs> angiographist, or uh, for surgeons anyway, invasive t specialists. Angiography may also be indicated when knowledge of coronary artery is necessary to advise about work of lifestyle needs, for, exa for example, dis discontinuing job or sports activities. Although angiographic findings do not directly show hemodynamic significance of coronary lesions, lesions, obstruction is assumed to be physiologically significant when the luminal diameter is reduced more than 70%. Okay? Although these findings do not directly show hemodynamic significance of coronary lesions, but we said to talk about more than 70%. So obstruction is assumed to be physiologically physiologically significant when the luminal diameter is reduced to more than 70%. The reduction correlates well with the presence of angina pectoris unless spasm or thrombosis is superimposed. Uh, intravascular ult ultrasonography uh, provides imaging of coronary artery structure. An ultrasound probe on the tip of catheter is inserted in the coronary arteries during angiography. This test can provide more information about coronary anatomy than other tests. It's indicated when the nature of lesions is unclear or when apparent disease severity doesn't match symptom severity. Used with angioplasty, it can help ensure optimal place placement of stents. Huh? Uh, guide wires uh, with pressure of low st sensors can be used to estimate blood flow across, across stenosis. Blood flow is expressed as fractional flow reserve, which is the ratio of maximal flow through the stenotic area to normal maximal flow. These flow measurements are most useful when evaluating the need for angioplasty or cabbage in patients with lesions or questionable severity, so 40 to 70 percent. And a fraction of low reserve is considered uh, of 1.0, huh? is considered normal, while and, uh, this reserve is less than 0 0.75 to 0 0.8, is associated with myocardial ischemia, and lesions with uh, this reserve more than 0 0.8 are less likely to benefit from stand placement. But now, who used this technique? I don't know, actually. Okay, imaging. Visualization technique. So, imaging studies does... Uh, to, so why we use imaging? To, to see a real heart contraction or real, uh, real heart ischemia problems. 
Now, imaging studies done at rest can evaluate the coronary arteries. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> so, electron beam, electron beam can detect the amount of calcium present, sorry, cal cal electron beam can detect the amount of calcium present in coronary artery plaque. The calcium score is uh, roughly proportional to the risk of subsequent coronary events. However, because calcium doesn't correlate well with the need for angioblasty or cabbage, huh? thus the American Heart Association recommends that screening with electron beam computer tomography should be done only for select groups of patients and is most valuable when com combined with historical and clinical data to estimate risk of death or non-fatal myocardial infarction. These groups may include asymptomatic patients with intermediate 10-year ACVD risk estimate 10 to 20 percent and symptomatic patients with equivocal stress test resulting. Electron beam computer tomography is particularly useful in ruling out significant coronary artery disease in patients presenting to the emergency department with atypical symptoms, normal troponin levels, and a low possibility of hemodynamically, hemodynamically significant coronary artery disease. So these patients have non-invasive testing as outpatients. Multi-detector row computer detector MDRST, uh, multi-detector row computer uh, coronary angiography, <coughs> sorry, can accurately accurately identify coronary stenosis and has a number of advantages. The test is non-invasive, can non-invasive, non-invasive, huh? non -invasive. can exclude coronary stenosis with high accuracy, can establish stent or bypass graft patency, can show cardiac and coronary venous anatomy, and can assess calcified and non-calcified plaque burden. However, radiation exposure is significant and the test is not suitable for patients with a heart rate more than 65 beats per minute. Those with irregular heartbeats and pregnant women. Patients must also be able to hold their breath for 15 to 20 seconds, three to four times during the study. So, evolving indications for multi-detector row computer tom tomography, coronary angiography, include asymptomatic high-risk patients of, or patients with atypical or typical angina who have in inconclusive exercise stress test results, cannot undergo exercise stress testing or need to undergo major non-cardiac surgery patients in whom invasive coronary angiography was unable to locate a major coronary artery or graft. Cardiac MRIs become invaluable in evaluating many cardiac and great vessel abnormalities. It may be used, it may be used to evaluate coronary artery disease by severe, several techniques which enable direct visualization of coronary stenosis, assessment of flow in the coronary arteries, evaluation of myocardial perfusion and metabolism, evaluation of wall motion abnormalities during stress, and assessment of infarcted myocardium versus viable myocardium. Current indications for cardiac MRI include evaluation of cardiac structure and function and assessment of myocardial viability. Cardiac MRI is specifically, specifically stress perfusion MRI and quantitative myocardial blood flow analysis may also be indicated for diagnosis and risk assessment in patients with either known or suspected coronary disease. Prognosis of angina. So we have to understand once again, huh? I talked about this about uh, in uh, previous lecture, so in all lectures. So we have to understand the treatment, diagnosis, uh, prognosis, etc., etc., is the same as for atherosclerosis, as for I don't know angina pectoris, as also all coronary artery disease problems. So this is the same, same etiological, pathological factors, and of course treatment and prognosis. 
Of course, acute coronary syndrome is acute situation, but the chain is the same. So the main adverse outcome of, of angina pectoris is what? Is uh, acute coronary syndrome, it's st unstable angina, myocardial infarction, and sudden death. Uh, no, uh, sudden death is due to arrhythmias. Due to arrhythmias. Okay, uh, annual, annual, annual mortality, annual mortality rate, annual mortality rate is about 1.4%, is about 1.4% in patients with angina, um, but no history of myocardial in infarction, a normal, uh, normal resting ECG, and normal blood pressure. However, women with coronary artery disease tend to have a worse prognosis. Mortality rate is about 7.5% when systolic hypertension is present. So seven, seven times more. 80.4% 80 when DCG is abnormal and 12 when both present. So if we've got uh, changes in, on, on ECG, huh? they, or we've got, and we've got hypertension, we can talk about 20% death of due to angina, angina pectoris, uh, angina, pect, angina, angina pectoris, the type 2 diabetes, about doubles the mortality rate for each scenario. So when you see patient with diabetes, so what is type 2 diabetes? Actually, this is one of the head, you know, you remember my history of the head of the dragons, uh, uh, heads of the dragon. So type 2 diabetes is metabolic syndrome. So type 2 diabetes about doubles the mortality rate for each scenario. Prognosis worsens with increased age, increasingly severe angina symptoms, presence of anatomic lesions, and poor ventricular function. Lesions in the left main coronary artery or proximal left anterior descending artery indicate particularly high risk. Although prognosis correlates with number and severity of coronary arteries affected, prognosis is surprisingly good for patients with stable angina, even though with three vessel disease, if ventricle function is normal. There is no surprise actually because the, uh, there is a si situation of preconditioning. Uh, preconditioning, so the uh, heart is um, training with ischemia in stable angina. Because, and, and by the way, once again, uh, anti uh, atherosclerotic plaque in stable angina are solid. And no problem with eruption of these uh, plaques. Okay, let's talk about treatment. Once again, we have to understand that this is the same history of treatment of angina pectoris. This is a treatment of uh, atherosclerosis, actually. Huh? So what do we've got? We've got modification of risk factors. This is the main and principal thing. My dear friends, you start, you see in all guidelines, all chronic disease modification of risk factors. What does it mean? Changing of lifestyle. So bad habits, smoking, cessation of smoking, and abuse of alcohol, controlling of blood pressure, lipids, and uh, physical activity. This, first of all, first is the principle, the most principle, primordial if you want, primordial. Then antiplatelet drugs, so aspirin and sometimes clopidogrel, prazugrel, or ticagrel, or beta blockers, nitroglycerin, and calcium, and calcium channel blockers uh, for symptom control. Symptom control. Angiotensine, angiotensine converting. Uh, Yes, angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE inhibitors, and statins. Revascularization is if, if symptoms persist despite medical therapy. <coughs> okay, so once again concerning reversible risk factors. Reversible, of course. Huh? What are them? So the, this is primordial one, once again as much as possible. So reverse, reversible risk factors are modified as much as possible. Smokers should stop smoking. 
More than two years after stopping smoking, risk of myocardial infarction is reduced to that of people who never smoked. Now we can talk about this. So even just to, if you smoke, for example, 30 years and you stop smoking more uh, two years after this, so risk of your myocardial infarction is reduced to that of people who never smoked. Hypertension. So we talk about blood pressure more than 130 and 80 for patients with coronary artery disease is treated diligently because even mild hypertension increases cardiac workload. Weight loss alone often reduces the severity of angina. No, oh, it's obvious. Sometimes treatment of mild left ventricle failure markedly lessens angina. Lessens angina. Paradoxically, digital is occasionally intensifies angina, presumably because increased myocardial contractility this is theory, speculation, of course, uh, because increased myocardial contractility increases oxygen demand, arterial tone is, is increased, or both. Aggressive reduction of total cholesterol. So, concerning uh, aggressive reduction of total cholesterol and uh, low lipid density lipoprotein, cholesterol via diet, of course, plus statins, uh, slows the progression of coronary artery disease, may cause some lesions to regress and improve endothelium function and thus arterial response to stress. But actually, concerning statins, it's now it's not so obvious as we uh, as we supposed, uh, as we thought. An exercise program emphasizing walking often improves the sense of well-being, reduces risk of acute ischemic events, and improves exercise tolerance. So anyway, so. Changing on lifestyle is the primordial. This is a 90% of your success. Now drugs. Yes, now drugs. The main goals of angina treatment are to relieve acute symptoms, prevent or reduce ischemia, prevent future ischemic events. So to relieve symptoms uh, during an acute attack, We've got some uh, medicals. First of all, of course, for the, uh, uh, this is a nitroglycerin. This is a nitroglycerin, of course, nitroglycerin. This is a nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a potent smooth muscle relaxant and vasodilator. Its main sites of action and in the peripheral vascular tree, especially in the venous, or capicitans system and in the coronary blood vessels. So even severe atherosclerosis, atherosclerotic vessels may dilate in areas without atheroma, severe atheroma. Nitroglycerin levels. Uh, nitroglycerin lowers systolic blood pressure and dilates systemic veins, thus reducing myocardial wall tension a major determinant of myocardial oxygen need. Some sublingual nitroglycerin is given for an acute attack for prevention before exertion. Dramatic relief usually occurs within 1.5 to 3 minutes, is completely by about 5 minutes and lasts up to 30 minutes. The dose may be repeated every 4 to 5 minutes uh, uh, up to three times to is, if, if relief is incomplete. Patients should always carry nitroglycerin tablets or aerosol spray to use promptly at the onset of an angina attack. Patients should store tablets in a tightly sealed, light-resistant glass container so that potency is not lost. Because the drug deteriorates quickly, small amounts should be obtained frequently. To prevent several, uh, to prevent ischemia, several classes of drugs are used. Huh? So, for preventing antiplatelet drugs, all patients diagnosed with coronary artery disease or at high risk of developing coronary artery disease, beta blockers, most patients unless contraindicated or not tolerated. So, beta blockers is the principal one. Uh, long, long acting nitrates if needed, and calcium channel blockers and if, of, uh, if needed, of course. So antiplatelet drugs.
antiplatelet drugs inhibit platelet aggregation. Aspirin binds irreversibly to platelets and inhibits cyclooxygenase and platelet aggregation. Other antiplatelet drugs, for example, clopidogrel, prazogrel, and ticagrelor block adenosine diphosphate induced platelet aggregation. These drugs can reduce risk of ischemic events, myocardial infarction, sudden death, but the drugs are most effective when given together. Patients unable to tolerate one should receive the other drug alone. Beta blockers? Ah, yes, about beta. About beta. Uh, beta blockers. Beta blockers limit symptoms and prevent infarction and sudden death better than other drugs. That we know for certain. So the beta blockers is king. Beta blockers block sympathetic stimulation of the heart and reduces sleep blood pressure, heart rate, contractility and cardiac output, thus decreasing myocardial oxygen demand and increasing exercise tolerance. Beta blockers also increase the threshold for ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation. Most patients tolerate these drugs well. Many beta blockers are available and effective. Dose is titrated, abort is needed, and, and until limited by bradycardia or adverse effects. Mm. Patients who cannot tolerate beta blockers are given a calcium channel blocker with negative chronotropic effects. Uh, for example, diltiazem and verapamil, those at risk of, of beta blocker intolerance for example, those with asthma, maybe try it on a cardioselective beta blocker. Or for example, bisoprolol. Perhaps with pulmonary function testing before and after drug administration to detect drug-induced bronchospasm. Uh, actually, concerning uh, beta blockers, I do advise you to make combination. Huh? If in in a situation of, for example, you've got your patient got anangina pectoris and hypertension, beta blockers with calcium channel blockers work together, especially effect, especially good. Uh, extra. So about long term nitrates, long term nitrates, uh, oral or transdermal are used if symptoms uh, persist after the beta blocker dose is maximized. If angina occurs at predictable times, a nitrate is given to cover those times. Oral nitrates include isosorbid denitrate and mononitrate, the active metabolite of denitrate. They are effective within one to two hours. Their effect lasts two for six hours. Sustained release formulations of isosorbid mononitrate appear to be effective throughout the day. From for, uh, for transdermal use, Cutaneous nitroglycerin patches have largely replaced nitroglycerin. Uh, ointment, ointments primarily because uh, primarily because ointments and are inconvenient and messy. Yes, messy. Not Ronaldo, messy. Patches slowly release the drug for a prolonged effect. Exercise capacity improves four hours after patch application and wanes in uh, 18 to 24 hours. Nitrate tolerance may occur, especially when plasma concentrations are kept constant. Because the risk of myocardial dysfunction is highest in early morning and afternoon or early evening respite period from nitrate is reasonable, reasonable uh, unless a patient commonly has angina at that time. Okay. From uh, for nitroglycerin, an eight to ten hour respite period seems sufficient. Isosorbide, isosorbide may require a 20, 20 hour respite period. If given once a day, a sustained release isosorbide mononitrate doesn't appear to electric to elicit to elicit tolerance. Tolerance. So about calcium channel blockers. Calcium. Calcium channel blockers. May be used, the calcium channel blockers may be used if symptoms persist despite use of nitrates or if nitrates are not 
tolerated. So calcium channel blockers are particularly useful if hypertension or coronary spasm is also present. present. Different types of calcium channel blockers may have different effects. De dehydropyridines or de dehydropyridines, for example, nifidipine, amlodipine, velodipine, have no chronotropic effects and vary substantially in their negative inotropic effects. Shorter acting de dehydropyridines may cause reflex tachycardia and are associated with increased mortality in patients with coronary artery disease. They should not be used alone to treat stable angina. Long Longer active acting formulations of dehydropyridine, dehydropyridines have uh, fewer tachycardic effects. They are most commonly used with a better blocker, as mentioned above. Huh? Among longer acting dehydropyridines, amlodipine has the weakest negative inotropic effects. It may be used in patients with left ventricle systolic dysfunction. Maybe. Diltiazem and verapamil, other types of channel, uh, calcium channel blockers, have negative chronotropic and inotropic effects. They can be used alone in patients with beta blocker intolerance or asthma and normal left ventricle, ventricular systolic function, but may increase cardiovascular mortality in patients with left ventricle uh, systolic, di uh, systolic dysfunction. Uh, uh, about sodium channel blockers, uh, okay, sodium, sodium, sodium channel blocker, ranolazine is a sodium channel blocker that can be used to treat chronic angina, ranolazine or ranolazine, because ranolazine may also prolong QT, cor QT interval, QT corrugated. It's usually reserved for patients in whom symptoms persist despite optimal treatment with other anti-anginal uh, anti drugs. Uh, ranolazine may not be as effective in women, in women as in men. Dizziness, headache, constipation, and nausea are the most common adverse effects. Uh, actually, about ranolazine is so-so. So, so uh, sinus node inhibitor. Actually, ivabradine, huh? Ivabradine or ivabradine is a sinus node inhibitor that inhibits inward sodium potassium current is a, a certain gated channel, so funny or F channel in sinus node cells, thus slowing heart rate without decreasing contractility. Uh, just on heart rate, huh? it can use it can be used for symptomatic treatment of chronic stable angina pectoris in patients with normal sinus rhythm who cannot take beta blockers or in combination with beta blockers in patients inadequately controlled by beta blocker alone and whose heart rate is more than sixty beats per minute. And revascularization, so revascularization. A revascularization, either with PCI, uh, NJ plus T, for example, or stenting, or cabbage, should be considered if angina persists, drug therapy, so angina persists despite drug therapy and worsens quality of life, or if anatomic lesions, noted during angiography, of course, uh, uh, put a patient at high risk of problems, of endpoints, of mortality, for example. The choice between PCI and cabbage depends on extent and location of anatomic lesions, the experience of the surgeon and medical center, and to some extent, patient preference. Why not? Why not? Okay, PCI. PCI is usually preferred uh, for one or two vessel disease with suitable anatomic lesions and is increasingly being used for three vessel disease. Lesions that are long or near bifurcation points are often not amenable to PCI. However, as TEN technology improves, PCI is being used for more complicated cases. But 
Okay, but in uh, more than two vessel disease, complicated situation, just use cabbage. Uh, cabbage is okay. So cabbage. Cabbage is very effective in selected patients with angina. Cabbage is superior to PCI in patients with diabetes and in patients with multivessel disease amenable to grafting. The ideal candidate, ideal, ideal candidate has severe angina pectoris and localized disease or diabetes mellitus. About 85% of patients have complete or dramatic symptom relief after cabbage. Exercise stress testing shows positive correlation between graft patency and improved exercise tolerance, but exercise tolerance sometimes remains improved despite graft closure. Yes, this is very interesting why. Cabbage improves survival for patients with left main disease. Those with, with trunk of left main, huh? those with three vessel disease and poor left ventricle function, and some patients with two vessel disease. However, for patients with mild or moderate angina, Canadian classification 1 two, or 2, or three vessel disease, and good ventricle function, cabbage appears to only marginally improve survival. PCI is increasingly being used for unprotected left main stenosis that is no left anterior descending or your circumflex graft present with outcomes as one year that are similar to cabbage. For patients with one vessel disease outcomes with drug therapy, PCI and cabbage are similar. Exceptions are left main disease and proximal left anterior descending disease for which revascularization appears uh, advantageous. Okay, key points. And conclusion. Angina pectoris occurs when cardiac workload exceeds the ability of coronary arteries to supply an adequate amount of oxygenated blood. Symptoms of stable angina pectoris range from a vague, barely troublesome ache to a severe, intense precordial crushing sensation. They are typically precipitated by exertion, last no more than a few minutes and subside with rest. Do stress testing with ECG for patients with normal resting ECG or with myocardial imaging, for example, echocardiography, radionuclide imaging, MRI for patients with abnormal resting ECG. Do coronary angiography with revascularization, percutaneous intervention or coronary artery bypass grafting is being considered. Give nitroglycerin for immediate relief of angina. Maintain patients on an antiplatelet drug, beta blocker and a statin, and add a calcium channel blockers for further symptom prevention if needed. And consider revascularization technique. If significant angina pectoris, angina pectoris persists despite drug therapy, or if lesions noted during angiography indicate high risk of mortality. So that's largely enough. I suppose, yes, I guess yes, that's enough. Concerning angina pectoris, once again we have to understand that this is the same history. Box of the boxes of the box. Huh? The main big box is Russian matryoshka, is metabolic syndrome with inflammation, then we we'll see uh, in, in this box a uh, smaller box, atherosclerosis. Then we we'll see coronary artery disease, coronary artery disease, clinical manifestation in angina, acute manifestation, acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction and stable angina, Q wave, non Q wave myocardial infarction, ST segment elevation, non ST segment elevation, uh, and death. Well, heart failure and death. So another box this is. So this is the main problem. So the treatment of all this is the same treatment. Of course, in acute situation, we need to revascularize or uh, rescue the patient. And don't forget, thank you for attention, don't forget to f follow our channel. So put on bell to be in current, uh, to be in touch with uh, our channel, Healthcare and Education. Please follow and subscribe and make your donations to our channel because we exist due to, uh, to your 
donations. So how uh, make these donations? How could you do? How could you do this? Your donation you can find in description of this video in YouTube. Mm, Mastercard or uh, another possibility up to you. You can see all all choices, all options of the, the for this for your possible donations. So thanks once again, thanks in advance, and see you in another lectures. God bless you. Bye.